So having talked about the basic macromolecules, let's now dive into the real metabolism of the nutrients. Let's start with carbs. So dietary carb burned as fuel within hours of absorption. Glucose catabolism. Catabolism means to break down. Remember, anabolism means to build up. Catabolism means to break down. This should be something that is seared into your brain. Um, we talked about this in, on day one of this semester. We talked about this in Bio 201. We talked about it in Bio 156. Everyone has to know this. Glucose, oxygen combined, your body then makes ATP. Makes a toxic waste product, carbon dioxide, makes a little bit of water, that's good, and it provides your body temperature. Transfers energy from glucose to ATP. Glucose is what plants make. Plants, by the way, if you want to talk about the miracle of life, plants, plants pull carbon dioxide out of the air, water out of the soil, and then they use the energy of the sun to manufacture glucose. So the energy that's in the bonds between the carbons and the hydrogens and the oxygens is literally the energy of the sun. That's not an analogy, that's not a metaphor. That's literally true. So bottom line is when you make a movement, when you move your arm, you just use the sun's energy. If you do energy you know, bookkeeping, that's what it ultimately is. That's not a metaphor. This is not as, as though it's like that. It is like that. It's the sun's energy. Ancient civilizations worshipped the sun. We made fun of them. Actually, they knew what they were talking about. The sun is the source of all life on planet Earth. So what happens is that glucose, which has the sun's energy, you transfer that to ATP. Energy in glucose is the energy of the sun. Three major pathways in glucose catabolism. Glycolysis. That yields two ATP in the absent. Well, that yields two ATP right off the bat. Glucose split into two pyruvic acid molecules. Then aerobic respiration. This is where one molecule of glucose produces 34 to 36 ATPs. That's aerobic in the presence of oxygen. Completely oxidizes pyruvic acid to CO2 and H2O. Then anaerobic fermentation, in the absence of oxygen, you end up producing then just two uh, molecules of ATP for every molecule of glucose. All you get is this, what you got from uh, gl uh, glyco glycolysis. And then the pyruvic acid is reduced to lactic acid, which is another toxic waste product. That's why anaerobic fermentation um, you know, you have to use it from time to time. When, when you need energy faster, then you can produce it with aerobic respiration. We talked about that in Bio 201. Remember oxygen debt when you, you know, after, after you work out hard and you're breathing hard? One of the things you're having to do is clear that lactic acid. Lactic acid produces fatigue. There's evidence that in the brain, that, it, that feeling you have, you know, I just can't run another step. I just can't do one more rep on the weights. Um, some of that may be actually the, the effects of lactic acid in the brain, that feeling of, you know, I just can't do this any longer, I'm too tired. Skeletal muscle tolerates lactic acid pretty well, heart muscle does not. And that's an issue then in, uh, well, in a heart attack, you can't do aerobic respiration anymore, lactic acid builds up. So, lactic acid is toxic. Brain uses aerobic respiration almost exclusively. exclusively. Brain wants glucose to make ATP. Skeletal muscle, heart muscle, happy to have fatty acids. Brain really wants glucose because it does only aerobic, and it needs a lot of glucose for that. So glycogen metabolism, ATP quickly used after it's formed, it is not a storage molecule. You don't store ATP. Extra glucose will be oxidized, it, uh, not be oxidized, rather, it will be stored. And how do you score, store glucose? As glycogen. Plants, remember, store glucose as starch. Animals store it as glycogen. You see a molecule of glycogen in the middle on the right there. Glycogenesis, and I want you to know this word. We have a bunch of these words coming up, and you have to know these. Glycogenesis, look at how easy it is. Glyco, root word, sugar. Genesis, first book of the Bible, create. What does glycogenesis mean? It means creating glucose. I mean, creating glycogen from glucose. Glycogen, notice you can break the word down into two overlapping segments. Glycogen, 
glycogenesis. You make glycogen from glucose. Glycogen genesis. Stimulated by insulin. Average adult contains around 450 grams of glycogen. We talked about this before. Roughly 325 in your skeletal muscles, about 125 in your liver. Those are approximate numbers. Those aren't hard numbers. Now, glycogenolysis. Look at that. You already know. Lysis means to break down. Glycogen. So what are you going to do? You're going to break down glycogen. Well, when you break down glycogen, what do you get? You get what it was made out of. So notice that glycogenesis and glycogenolysis are opposites of one another. Glycogenesis means taking glucose and making glycogen. Glycogenolysis means taking glycogen and breaking it down into glucose. Stimulated by glucagon and epinephrine. So sympathetic nervous system, epinephrine, you need blood sugar to make ATP to bite the chupacabra. So epinephrine does that and glucagon as well. Remember, insulin and glucagon are antagonistic hormones. Insulin lowers blood sugar. It does that by pulling glucose out of the blood and storing it as glycogen. Glucagon raises blood sugar. How? Well, by breaking down glycogen and returning glucose to the blood. Only liver cells can release glucose back into the blood. Skeletal muscle, the glycogen only gets used in that muscle. Glycogenesis, glycogenolysis are opposites of each other. Then gluconeogenesis. Look at the root words again. These are so easy if you just think about them. Gluconeogenesis. That means making new glucose. Now, don't tell me if I ask about this on a quiz or exam that you make glucose from sugar. No, sugar is already made of glucose. Gluconeogenesis means making glucose from non-carbs, meaning you take fats and amino acids from the breakdown of proteins and you actually form glucose. So you can basically take any dietary component and turn it into glucose. That's how efficient and clever your body is. You can make energy from anything. Gluconeogenesis. There's a nice diagram showing the red and the green pathway showing how opposites glycogenesis and uh, glycogenolysis are. So we did carb metabolism. Let's turn to lipids. Remember the main dietary fat and the main storage fat for you, triglycerides. Triglycerides are stored in adipocytes. They form adipose tissue. Constant turnover of molecules every three weeks or thereabouts. You, you move fat around. You move fat around and you re manufacture it all the time. Um, re released into the blood, transported, either oxidized or redeposited in other fat cells. Lipogenesis. Look at the root words again. Lipo, fat, genesis, create. Lipogenesis, creating fats. Now, on a quiz or an exam, don't tell me that you make fats from triglycerides. Triglycerides already are fats. Lipogenesis means making fats from things that aren't fats. Just as gluconeogenesis made, meant making glucose from things that aren't sugars, lipogenesis means making fat from things that aren't fats. So you can make lipids from amino acids and from sugars. So there you go. There are the three main dietary macromolecules. What that says is no matter what you eat, whether you're eating protein or whether you're eating carbs, if you eat more than you can use right now, your body will store those as fats, lipogenesis. This is a survival mechanism. You know, Paleolithic humans, when you came across a food source, who knew when you were going to find food again? There weren't any circle caves in 3000 BC. All right, so you, you gorged yourself on food when you found it, and then your body was efficient at packing it away for later, storing it. So no matter what you eat, proteins, carbs, you can store them as fat. Amino acids used to make fatty acids. Sugars used to make glycerol. And look what happens there. Got a glycerol, got fatty acids. What, do we, what, do we can, what can we make now? A triglyceride, by golly. Lipolysis. Look at the root words. Lipolysis. Breaking down lipids. So if you're going to break down lipids, what would you break them down into? I'm asking a big red rock eater question here. We've been over this, all right. How many months have 28 days? All of them. Okay, triglycerides, the principal dietary lipids, broken down into glycerol and fatty acids, all right. Glycerol converted to PGAL enters glycolysis. So, so glycerol works basically as a glucose. 
Fatty acids are broken down two carbons at a time to produce acetyl-CoA. Acetyl-CoA is an incredibly useful molecule. We'll see that coming up. This process, by the way, is called beta oxidation. And you can see nice diagrams on the right showing the pathways, and we'll try to go over those in a little more detail. Here, uh, zoomed in, I'm going to try to, uh, I'm trying to track down a whiteboard. I've got my colored markers at home, of course, because I buy my own colored markers and I kill other faculty members if they touch them. And uh, I'm going to try to use a whiteboard here at home and do this. I normally do a presentation on the whiteboard to show the entire metabolism of carbs, proteins, and lipids. I'm going to try to set up the whiteboard and get that done. Ketogenesis. You've heard of keto diets, all right? Well, here, let's find out what's going on there. Ketogenesis means, of course, making ketones, ketogenesis. Fatty acids catabolize into acetyl groups by beta oxidation in the mitochondrial matrix. We said that in the previous slide. They can enter the citric acid cycle as acetyl-CoA, that incredibly useful molecule, and they can undergo ketogenesis metabolized by the liver to produce ketone bodies. Ketone bodies include acetoacetic acid, beta-hydroxybutyric acid, and acetone. These are basic ketone bodies. Now, ketone bodies are not bad. They're good. You can use them to produce energy. What can happen, though, rapid or incomplete oxidation of fats raises blood ketone levels. That's called ketosis, and that can lead to a pH imbalance called ketoacidosis. Ketones will lower pH. So you may know this is something I hope we're going to talk about at some point later. We've had to cut so many things out. I'm pretty sure we get to it. One of the things that diabetics face is something called diabetic ketoacidosis. Diabetics, remember, don't produce insulin or they're not responsive to insulin. Therefore, um, they can't metabolize carbs for energy. They have to do a lot of fat metabolism to get energy. And when they do that, they may raise their ketone levels. That can cause a serious acid-base imbalance called ketoacidosis. And it's because, because it's caused by their diabetes, we call it diabetic ketoacidosis, DKA. You notice there's, there's also this fad of the ketogenic diets, low-carb, high-fat. I'm not going to say anything good or bad. Nutritionists are kind of split on this. Um, it's not necessarily bad. You just got to be careful. And you got to expect things to get weird for a while. Uh, when the brain switches to having to use ketones and fats rather than glucose, it's a little disorienting for a little bit. And they're happy because they eat lard. Oh, yes. Weren't the 50s wonderful? And there's a whole thing these days about keto crotch. Um, the people who are on the ketogenic diet end up with a nasty keto crotch smell. I, I don't know. I don't know. We, we, uh, collect data. See what you think. Keto crotch, seriously smelly side effect of popular diet. My aunt tagged my cousin in this strange keto diet article. Oh, that's, that's what ants are for, right? Beware of the keto crotch. Women complain of a smelly vagina as a side effect of following low-carb diet. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to go around and try to find out. My keto crotch don't stink, but I can see that crotch now thanks to keto. Winning. Hashtag winning. Gluco, uh, gluconeogenesis refers to what? Breaking down proteins into glucose. Making glucose from glycogen. Breaking down starch into sugar. Making glucose from fats and amino acids. Breaking down fats into glucose. Pause the video. Figure out the answer. Then come back. There you go. Making new glucose. Not from existing carbs of any kind. You're making glucose from non-carbs. So protein metabolism, the amino acid pool, dietary amino acids plus 100 grams of tissue protein broken down each day into free amino acids. You've got tons of free amino acids roaming around. They can use, be used to synthesize new proteins. Remember, proteins are like a big string of beads where every bead is an amino acid. Well, you can take all the amino acids you've got and put them together in whatever protein you need. That's the, the power of metabolism. You make what you need from raw materials. For fuel, they have to be deaminated. That means cutting off the NH2. Remember, an amino acid is called an amino acid because it has an amino group, the NH2, and a carboxylic acid, the COOH. 
Well, when your body decides to break down amino acids for use, the first thing your body does is deaminate them, which means cutting off that NH2. Well, think back to basic chemistry here. Like carbon, how many molecules does a carbon molecule like to grab a hold of? Four. What about nitrogen? What does nitrogen, how many molecule, how many atoms does nitrogen like to grab? Likes to grab three. So if you chop off an NH2, what's the most available atom floating around out there in the ECF? Hydrogen, actually. Simple. Protons, all right? So the nitrogen will grab another hydrogen, and then it becomes NH3. And do you remember what NH3 is, boys and girls? That's ammonia, and that's toxic. So when you deaminate amino acids, you end up with this toxic ammonia byproduct. Now, that can't be done, so we need to work with that. So we'll work with that. What's going to happen with the rest of the amino acid? The rest of the amino acid is basically just carbs, just carbons, hydrogens, oxygens. Well, we can make pyruvic acid, acetyl-CoA, dump that into the citric acid cycle. During a shortage of amino acids, the reverse occurs for protein synthesis. Okay, so we stick amino acids on. We stick the amine group on. And the NH2 becomes ammonia, like I just said, which is toxic, which the liver converts to urea, and that's excreted in the urine. So look in the lower left, that molecule. Urea is just two NH2s, two amino groups, bonded to a carbon with a double-bonded oxygen. The liver turns that into, that. well, the liver, that is what the liver makes, urea. It takes the ammonia out of your blood and converts it into urea, which is okay. It can travel in the blood. It's not toxic like ammonia was. There you go, nice diagram of the whole deal. Okay. There you go, the, the process of making urea called the ornithine cycle, or now I think sometimes just called the urea cycle. But there you go. Look at how you come in on the left. So you come in with an NH3, go through all those steps, end up with a urea. And cycles attached to these railings will be removed. And look at that renegade person. They attach the Krebs cycle. Oh, that bastard. I hope they catch him. Liver converts ammonia to urea, removed from blood by the kidneys. That's why it's called urine. The ornithine cycle or urea cycle. There we are, Torrey Grand Canyon, right after a rain. Beautiful rainbow. The layer there below the rim, that's called the red wall layer. It's kind of bright orange now. It's kind of red when it's cloudy. Okay, coming up next, another digestive metabolism PowerPoint, and I think we're done.